Good morning. Welcome to Cedars Unitarian Universalist Church. My name is Brian, and I am the worship associate for our virtual service today, alongside our minister, Zachary Vinson. Before we start, let's pause to acknowledge that members of our congregation occupy the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Coast Salish tribes, the homelands of the Suquamish, Duwamish, Clallam, and Chimicum people, were seated under duress through the Point Elliot and Point No Point treaties. We are grateful guests on these lands and affirm indigenous sovereignty both past and present. This acknowledgement does not substitute for the need to build authentic relationships with modern day members of these tribes and to learn about their living culture and history. Our faith community is sustained by the generosity of our members. Your contribution will nurture the spiritual growth of our community through weekly worship and ongoing programs that cultivate connection, belonging, sharing, and caring. Included in the video description and displayed on the screen is information to make a comp contribution to Cedars through our PayPal account. Please take time either now or later in the service to make a contribution to help sustain Cedars. Your gifts are greatly appreciated. Cedars is committed to being a welcoming and inclusive community. In all the beauty of languages, cultures, and skin tones that come together in your uniqueness, we welcome you. In all the ways you experience and express gender, and in the beauty of whom and how you love, we welcome you. With all the religious and ethical traditions that inform your spiritual life, we welcome you. You are invited to join us today and always with an open mind, a loving heart, and willing hands. The passion and conviction of Thomas Starr King resonates across the decades. Prior to preparing this reflection, I had never heard about this beloved and uncompromising 19th century social justice advocate. I was pleased and inspired to discover a kindred spirit in this Unitarian Universalist preacher from another era. As I read through a collection of King's writings, I was deeply moved by his fearlessness and skill in speaking truth to power against slavery and all forms of oppression. But soon, I felt rage seething and bubbling within me. I am angry that the roots of enslavement, impoverishment, and oppression have not been adequately addressed during the past 150 years. Thomas Starr King says, there can be no such thing as justice until people in large masses are rightly related to each other. Sadly, racism, misogyny, and the criminalization of poverty still conspire to maintain the concentration of power and wealth that keeps us divided. We've made progress, but there is so much more work to be done. After a year like 2020, it is a struggle not to feel discouraged and overwhelmed. Where do we start? One of Thomas Starr King's characteristics really jumped out at me. Beyond his powerful words, he was a man of action and integrity. He did not subscribe to any fixed creed, but consistently sought a universal truth beyond his ego identity in relationship with others. Today's politics are more deeply entrenched in certainty than ever, so much so that the very nature of truth and reality are being challenged. We are all prone to slip into an identity of being right at the expense of doing what's right for the greater good. What use is a Black Lives Matter sign or a native land acknowledgement if we aren't each actively seeking to be in relationship with Black, Brown, and Indigenous peoples? This week in the Seattle Emerald, Rainier Valley's award-winning community-based news, Xing He laments community leaders who tout progressive stances in opposition to the political right. In their effort to feel good about doing the right things and being on the right side, our region's most vulnerable people continue to suffer. Xing imagines a post-COVID future where the label progressive cannot be claimed any longer until diseases, laws, and policies do not have a disparate impact on poor, vulnerable communities of color. Thomas Starr King reflects similarly in his question, how shall the church, which contains the regenerative principles of truth, 
be brought from its serene and comfortable elevation into redeeming contact with the streets, lanes, and cellars of the world. He also said, I feel I must preach devotion to humanity as the highest outward form of gospel and the obligation of doing the most good that possibly can be done by all of a man's influence. I hope you'll be as moved by King's example as I was. I will continue to reflect on how I can best contribute to the ongoing struggle for community justice and liberation. I'll now leave you with these words from Thomas Starr King. We are not intended to be separate, private persons, but rather fibers, fingers, and limbs. The aim of religion is not to perfect us as persons, looking at each of us apart from others. There can be no such thing as justice until men and large masses are rightly related to each other. As we, As we come, come together, together to worship, worship we, we remind, remind ourselves to treat all people kindly because they are our brothers and sisters, to take good care of the earth because it is our home, and to live lives full of love and goodness because that is how we will all become the best that we can be. Hello everyone and Happy New Year and welcome to this first church service of the 2021 year. I hope that this year is full of many bless blessings and good fortune for all of us and that many of those things we would rather leave in 2020 remain there. Before continuing into our worship service, I want to remind everyone that next Sunday, January 10th, we will be having a congregational meeting following the service. This is a chance for everyone to gather together and to hear about some of the things that have happened in our congregation over the last several months, as well as to, to begin engaging in a conversation that we started a few weeks ago with our new member recognition service around the idea of what it means to belong here at Cedars. 
since this service, the board and I have had a series of conversations and are working to put together an initiative that would call us to explore this theme of belonging and find ways that we can become a more welcoming community together. So I'd encourage all of you next Sunday to join us after the service for this meeting and to learn how you can be part of this, this new ministry that we are called to here at Cedars. With that said, I invite us into this time and space of worship with these words by William F. Scholes. Come into this place of peace and let its silence heal your spirit. Come into this place of memory and let its history warm your soul. Come into this place of prophecy and power and let its vision change your heart. Come, let us worship together. I want to tell you a story today about a little boy who loved the mud. The little boy's name was Hosea Ballou, and Hosea Ballou lived a long time ago in the 1770s. He was a little boy. And Hosea Ballou lived on a farm. And this was fantastic for Hosea because, as I think I mentioned, Hosea loved the mud. He loved it so much that spring was his favorite season because it rained and mud was everywhere. And Hosea loved mud when it was thick and squishy. And he loved it when, when it was thin and runny. And he loved to squish his toes down in the mud. And he loved to run it around in his fingers. He just loved the mud. And so often he would just sit down and play in a mud puddle and he would get mud on his toes and he would get mud on his knees and he would get mud on his tummies and his elbows and even his eyebrows. <sighs> Hosea had two older sisters. He actually had nine siblings, but two older sisters who were in charge of cleaning him up. And as you might imagine, they routinely were constantly saying, Oh, Hosea. And Hosea lived in a time before there was running water. So they had to heat some water, wash him off, hand wash his clothes. And they did this lovingly. But after a while, they went to their father and they said, Father, please ask Hosea to stop playing in the mud. And so Mr. Ballou, called Hosea in and he said, Hosea, you cannot play in the mud. And Hosea, whose other favorite thing besides mud was asking questions, said, why? And his father, who was a Baptist minister, said, well, Hosea, we try to do good and we try to do right. And one of the good and right things that we can do to make God happy is to stay clean. And so Hosea said, okay, Papa, I will try not to play in the mud. And so Hosea didn't have quite as good a time, but he tried really, really hard not to sit down and play in the mud. He didn't make himself mud puddles anymore. He tried, but you know what? Hosea lived on a farm. 
And so there was just mud all around all of the time. And sometimes he got mud on himself. And often, once he had a little mud on himself, he thought, well, you know, I'm already muddy. And then there you would be covered in mud up to his eyebrows again. And his sisters would sigh and they would clean him up. And eventually though, they went back to their father and they said, Papa, please tell Hosea to stop laying in the mud. And his father was a little more stern this time and he called Hosea in and he said, I thought we had this discussion. I need you to stop playing in the mud. And Hosea almost asked why, but then he remembered and he did not do that. And he said, I am sorry. It's just so hard. Sometimes I get dirty, but I will try. And that is what Hosea did. And again, most of the time, it went really well. He was getting better and better at avoiding the mud. But then once, again, he lived on a farm. He got covered in mud and his father saw him. And his father this time was pretty angry. And he said, Hosea, I thought I told you to stay out of the mud. And Hosea said, Dad, do you still love me? And Hosea's father said, Son, I don't like it when you get dirty. I don't like the actions that you're taking, but I will always love you, no matter how dirty you are. And Hosea smiled. And he said, I promise I will try to stay clean. And that's exactly what he did, mostly because he was getting older. And Hosea grew up and he became a minister just like his dad, except that he wasn't just like his dad because of instead of being a Baptist, Hosea became a universalist. And Hosea became a universalist because of the mud, because he thought, if my dad loved me, even when I was covered in mud, even when I had done something I was not supposed to do, God will feel the same way. God is love. And God doesn't care how dirty we are or about the mistakes we make. God loves us for who we are. And that is the message that Hosea began to preach all over the country. And he became incredibly well known and more and more people became universalists because of Hosea Ballou and his experience with mud. And that is my story. I want to invite us into a time of prayer together. Well, let's start with taking a deep breath. Let's breathe in and out. Center ourselves in this moment with these words by Susan Milner. Eternal God, mother and father, spirit of life, we gather grateful for the companionship of hearts and minds seeking to speak the truth in love. We gather grateful for our heritage, for the women and men before us whose prophetic words and deeds make possible our dreams and our insight. We gather grateful for the gifts of life itself, Mindful that to respect life means both to celebrate what life is and to insist on what it can become. May we always rejoice in life and work to cultivate a sense of giftedness. But may we also heed the call to transformation and growth. May we find in ourselves the strength to face our adversaries, the integrity to name them, and the vision to overcome them. May we honor in pride the heroines and heroes of our past, but may we also keep company with the fallen, the broken, and the oppressed.
For in the dazzling of noonday's heat, and in the star-studded shimmering of night's rich blackness, we are they. Amen. In 1931, two bronze statues were placed by the state of California in the Rotunda in Washington, D.C. These statues were placed as part of the emerging tradition that allows each state two such statues in the Rotunda to represent important figures from the representative states. One of these statues placed by the state of California was the likeness of a man named Junipero Serra. Father Sarah was a Roman Catholic priest and Franciscan friar 
who is credited with founding the mission system in California, a system that used coerced conver conversion to decimate the culture of indigenous people in the region. The legacy of Sarah is not a pretty one. And thinking of how uh, this legacy is celebrated with this statue, it does make you pause and wonder what cruel acts must have been perpetrated by the other person placed in the rotunda by Californians. So the second statue that was placed in the Capitol Rotunda bears the likeness of a, a short young man. It was about five foot one by the name of Thomas Starking. But who was Thomas Starking? And why is his life and accomplishments worth commemorating in our nation's capital? Thomas was the eldest of six children born to Thomas Farrington King and Susan Starr King on December 17, 1824 in New York City. His father was a Universalist minister who was noted among the clergy for his fervor with which he preached self-renunciation for the sake of Christ. Thomas, or just Star, as he became known, spent much of his early years in a small village in New Hampshire before his family settled in Charleston, Massachusetts. There was no high school in Charleston, so when Star decided he wanted to go to college, he followed the custom of the time and was tutored for college by the local grammar school principal. His dream of higher education was dashed when, at the age of 15, Starr's father, Thomas Farrington King, died suddenly. This death forced Starr into the role of providing for his family, and over the next several years, he worked as a store clerk, bookkeeper, assistant teacher, and grammar school principal, among many other odd jobs he held. During this time, Starr also started attending the Unitarian Church in Medford and is cited for telling his aunt that he intended to study for the Unitarian ministry. He wrote, I believe that the Unitarian Party as a whole understands themselves better and are doing nobler work than the Universalists. I am sick of the miserable dogmatism which measures the greatness and worth of every person and sect by the openness and clearness with which they have avowed the final restoration. In short, Starr expressed a desire to be part of a faith movement that saw beyond the dogmatism and nice words and instead engaged with the noble work that is the calling of people of faith. Despite never earning a formal degree, Starr was considered to be highly educated and was mentored by many of the influential thinkers of the day, including both Universalist and Unitarian ministers. Eventually, Starr was granted an honorary master's degree from Harvard and as a result was permitted to enter the ministry. However, despite being considered one of the brightest ministers in Boston at the time, Starr was also looked down upon by many of those people known as the Boston Brahmins. He was looked down on because of his lack of education. Starr spent most of the time from 1845 to 1860 serving several Unitarian and Universalist congregations around the Boston area. During this time, he met and married Julia Wiggin, and they had two children together. While serving as the minister at the Hollis Street Church, conflict broke out among the congregation around their stance on the growing temperance and anti-slavery movements of the day. Despite this division, 
Starr was able to keep the congregation together. He preached sermons on the theological opposition to enslavement and the virtues of sobriety in, in a way that was compelling to people and caused people to shift their opinions and join the cause. He also implored many of his colleagues to join these movements, saying, I would insist as strongly as anyone on the right and duty of ministers to act as reformers, to speak in anti-slavery meetings and temperance and peace meetings if they have power of popular address. Let them act as reformers in the proper sphere of such social action, and in the pulpit let them attack the central throne of sin in the private heart. Essentially, Starr called on his ministerial colleagues to use their pulpits and social vocation to influence the conversation around these issues and to help counsel people away from these sins. Eventually, Starr's health began to fail, and he took a leave of absence from the Hollis Street Church and left for San Francisco with his family. He hoped that the change of scenery and warmer climate would cause his health to improve. He also hoped in this isolated location he would not be looked down upon for his lack of formal education. The San Francisco Unitarian Church was founded in 1850 and was just under 10 years old when Starr and his family arrived in the still-growing city of San Francisco. In this time, the 10 years that this church has existed, they had managed to build their own building, though they still owed about $20,000 for construction and building costs. However, not long after arriving in San Francisco, Starr was offered the role as minister at the San Francisco Unitarian Church. Within a year of starting, the congregation had somehow managed to miraculously pay off all of this debt while simultaneously outgrowing the building that they had previously built. And as a result, under Starr's supervision, the church began construction of a Gothic-style building, which was dedicated on January 10, 1864. These weren't the only successes of Starr's California ministry, though. In fact, these are just a few of the small successes he accomplished. During his years in San Francisco, the Civil War was raging on in our country. When California was admitted into the Union in 1850, they did so as a free state. Now, however, many influential people in this state found themselves growing sympathetic towards the Confederacy. However, given Starr's previous commitment to the anti-slavery movement, he felt compelled to speak out and work to convince people to stay in the Union. As a result, Starr set out by stagecoach across California, and he used his oratory skills and conviction to convince people to side with the Union. Through a series of lectures and public speeches, Starr worked to win the hearts and minds of the people of California and help to shed light on the inhumane conditions of slavery. He spoke of the dignity of enslaved people and helped to use his influence and helped use his influence to bring an end to this cruel institution. For his efforts and tireless workings, Thomas Starr King was cited by Abraham Lincoln with keeping California in the Union and helping to win the Civil War. This is the accomplishment that Starr is most remembered for. But it's not his only. His brief time as a trustee for the College of California at Oakland, later UC Berkeley, 
helped lay the foundation for California's university system. Starr is also cited with raising much needed money to fund the Sanitary Commission, which later became the Red Cross. Despite all of these accomplishments, on March 4th, 1864, Thomas Starr King died. He had continued his ministry and important work until his fail health failed him. Consumed by diphtheria and pneumonia, his body finally gave out. Despite only being 39 years old at the time of his death, it's hard to deny the impact he had on our country, the state of California, and our Unitarian Universalist faith. With a legacy like this, it's perhaps easy to see why a statue of such a person would be enshrined in the U.S. Capitol. Thomas Starr King was a man who stood in stark contrast to the figure of Unipero Serra. Serra's legacy is one of subjugation and control, whereas Starr King's is one of freedom and choice. Thomas Starking believed in the worth and dignity of every person and dedicated his life to upholding this principle. Sure, he is not perfect. Nobody is. But his accomplishments continue to underline and inspire liberation today. Turning back to the statue in conjunction with this legacy, I'm baffled by a decision made by the California State Legislature in 2006. A decision to remove Thomas Starking's statue from our nation's capital and replace it with a statue of former President Ronald Reagan. Unipero Serra remains, but the statue of Thomas Starking was moved to the California State Capitol building in Sacramento where it still remains today. Despite the demotion of this statue from our nation's capital, the legacy of Thomas can still be found in the schools that bear his name. Despite never receiving a formal ministerial education, students at Star King School for the Ministry still draw on his legacy today, preparing for the work of ministry in an environment that calls into question structures of power and encourages the dismantling of sources of oppression. Today, we are called again as a people of faith to work for liberation, to live into the legacy left to us by Thomas Starking. We know that the sin of racism is alive and well. We know that strife and misinformation runs rampant. And we know that someone must do something about it. Recognizing this, I close with Thomas Starking's call for us to act as reformers in the proper sphere for social action. May this be the call that we feel pulling us forward this day to the glory of life.
we, we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our service this day has ended, but our service to the world and one another begins anew. May we be informed by our values and legacy in a way that compels us to act with compassion and love as we move into the future. May this be our closing prayer this day. Amen.